Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Tibin webinar that will be focused on doing business in India. This webinar is part of the Cubin project. The aim of the Cubin project is to help European SMEs with business and innovation in emerging markets. Cubin was set up by a consortium of experts in the field of cultural differences with the involvement of SMEs and innovation agencies. Cubin is fully financed by the European Commission, executed under the guidance of EASME, the European Agency for Small and Middle-Sized Enterprises. The project also includes learning circles. You can see more information on that slide. They take place in emerging economies or virtually, and you can find more information on the circles if you're interested in participating on the Cubin platform. Some technicalities about the webinar. We have muted your microphones to increase the quality of the sound. If you have questions, please send them either to this Ofstudio Insights or you can also send them to our host of today, Nadir and Divya. There will be a Q&A phase uh, for two weeks after the webinar has ended. If you have any question, then feel free to send them in the forum of the Cubin platform, and our experts will answer to your interrogations. I will now leave the floor to our two wonderful hosts of today, Nadir Karanjia and Divya Suzanne Varki. Nadir, you'll have to unmute your uh, microphone because we don't hear you. Hello? Can you hear me? That's good. That's better. Okay, super. Sorry about that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Doing Business in India webinar, which is conducted by myself and my colleague, Ms. Divya Susan Varke from Bangalore. I am myself based in Bombay, Mumbai. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about both of us. We're both with Hofstetter Insights, and uh, I have been in the um, uh, cross-cultural space for about 14 years with Hofstetter. Um, I have an entrepreneurial background in information technology, and uh, areas of expertise are multicultural team training, ICM interventions, and uh, business development strategy for companies across the globe. Trainings have been conducted in India, Singapore, China, Taiwan, so I have a little bit of international experience. And of course, uh, with several colleagues on webinars, um, uh, pretty much like this for the EU and for other countries as well. Um, I'll hand over to Divya to introduce herself, and uh, then we will continue. Thank Divya? you, Nadir. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to see all of you this evening. Thank you for the interest you're showing to this webinar. Um, like Nadir said, I'm also certified in intercultural communications management by the Hofstede uh, Insights. Um, and I've been associated with Hofstede Insights since 2013. Um, I also do, um, I have a double master's degree, one in communication and more recently in intercultural communications at the University of Lugano in Switzerland. Um, like Nadia you said, I'm based in Bangalore. I work a lot um, with Swissnext, um, which is affiliated with the Swiss Consulate uh, General, um, where I train delegations of entrepreneurs, uh, researchers, scientists who come into India to set up space here. Um, I also have Mercedes-Benz Research and Development India as a client and do expatriate trainings for companies like Boeing, Nike, Unilever, Goldman Sachs, uh, General Motors, etc. Um, where I train expatriates who come into India from different countries as well as Indians who move to different countries abroad. Um, I will be talking more to you later on uh, during this webinar, but as of now, I hand over the mic back to Nadir. Enjoy yourself, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Divya, and thank you, Celia, for that very nice introduction for both of us. Uh, let's begin. So what, we, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take the first section, which will touch on things like uh, winning business in India, finding partners, the time and investment required, and Divya will take the session after that on markets and uh, uh, negotiations and knowing customers, because she's, she's very well versed with that. So I'm beginning from an assumption that we all should make, uh, which is based on something that Peter Drucker, the management guru, says, that what managers and business people and 
consultants and professionals want to do the world over is really the same thing. They want to succeed. But how they achieve that is really embedded in their tradition and culture, their value systems, and the way they're used to doing things. So this is something that is necessary to understand when you are trying to work across borders. Um, and one of the most important things to understand is that though your goals will probably all be the same to succeed, to have a very thriving business, to make strong relationships, the methods that you use or the way that you go about it is different from culture to culture. Now, let's, let's explore, explore that a little bit. And I changed Peter Drucker's uh, uh, a very famous saying uh, to something like this. What you want to do as a business person is win business. And you want to find the right partners to do it with. But how you achieve that has a lot to do, how you achieve or do not achieve, how much success you have or failure, depends on how much time and investment you are willing to make to understand the target culture properly. So it's not like you can just pick up a system and plant it somewhere else and expect it to function perfectly. So why is this the case? Okay, this is the case because people are different at a unit level. And cultures are groups of people who are different at a macro level. So because of all these differences, it is very important to spend time to invest yourself and commit to understanding a target culture better. And nowhere I think it applies more than doing business in India. Now, if you see the map of India over there, that very colorful map, you will see that we have a north zone, a west zone, a south zone, and an east zone. This is really the way people normally kind of carve up the country to create strategy um, and, and, and um, build partnerships and set up networks and all that kind of stuff. We have a big, big, big market. There are about a one, there are 1 1.2 billion people in our country, probably 1.3. Middle class of approximately 260 million. The last time I checked, that was close to the population of the United States. Um, widespread use of English language. We have a youngish population and they have a strong work ethic and desire to succeed with the enterprising, they take hardships in their day-to-day -day life. In India, everything is a little difficult. Things don't come easy. Um, it's a struggle sometimes to, to, to go from one place to another, to go from your house to the office. These are things people just swallow up and deal with and, and roll with the punches, so to speak. So they're complex. There's religious diversity. There's multiple faiths and beliefs. We have 22 different main languages, 13 written scripts, and 720 different dialects. And the thing that I haven't printed in this slide is that there are 330 million gods and goddesses. So you can imagine the immense differences in, in, in the north, south, east, west. So it's easy to break it up in north, south, east, west. But we, within each section, within each zone, there are immense differences amongst the Indian people. And have to be dealt with accordingly. Uh, this one. Okay, so a lot of the, uh, and this, sub, this is substantiated with, with a lot of research from even global brands that are beginning to realize and have realized for a while, particularly FMCG, which is fast moving consumer goods. And they see that there are many Indias, as the headline says, there are many Indias within India. So you can imagine that if there are many Indias or many different kinds of cultures, one shoe does not fit all feet, right? you have to essentially modify your strategy to meet your market requirement. Okay, so let's move on. So how is also a very big issue. And the how is, how do you create an environment of trust and credibility with your business partners, with your market, with your target market in such a complex country? Okay, and all this trust and credibility is the absolute basis for effective cross-border and uh, virtual work and, and, and cross-cultural work. So business and trust go hand in hand. And in a country like India, winning business 
really depends on winning trust. If you don't have trust, it's very difficult to move forward, okay? So in order to do that, in order to build trust, what you have to do, coming from a different culture, is get out of your, your comfort zone. And what do I mean by that? Well, your comfort zone is the place that you're happy and comfortable to function in, okay? To develop trust and credibility in a complex and a different culture, you have to be willing to move out of your comfort zone. It's like the fish jumping out of that pond into a bigger ocean. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a visual to communicate that concept, okay? So we are a land of dichotomy. What does that mean? That means simultaneous as well as diversely different truths exist at the same time. Wow, what does that mean? So whatever you say is true of India is also simultaneously untrue at the same time. You never say never, you never say always here. You have to be prepared to question your own processes, perceptions, methods of doing business and preferences too. And you have to be open for very new thinking processes. Prepare for a new normal is what I like to tell customers. And that means be prepared to be flexible, okay? In India, flexibility is a very, very valuable component of, uh, of building relationships. Now, there was a saying, uh, it's an Arab proverb, we don't know who discovered the sea, but we're sure it was not a fish. What does that mean? Well, that means, as an illustration, if you asked a fish, if you found a fish that could talk, and you asked him, you jumped into the water, you went down and you asked him, excuse me, Mr. Fish, can you describe the sea? What is he going to say? But if you take him out of the sea and put him on the land for a few minutes and then put him back in the sea and say, now can you describe the sea? He will be able to write a thesis on it. Why? Because now he knows the difference. So just like that, just like the same rule would be for me, the same rule would be for you, that we are so used to our own thinking, we are so used to our own cultural envelope, that unless we are aware of the differences in another culture, we cannot really understand that culture. So the differences are the most important thing. And this is what this actually means. Okay, so what we're going to do now, I'm just going to very quickly go through uh, a few slides explaining some of the things that I want to explain to you. If you imagine an iceberg, for instance, when you first encounter a culture, there's a visible section. It's a very easy section to see. It's how you dress, it's what you look like, the music, the art, things like that that are very visible, which normally we identify cultures with. But what is really hidden from us? And that's where the question of time and investment in understanding a culture comes into play. It's the behavior, the attitude, the values, the preferences, and the practices, because those are driven by these other things that are hidden. So you have to spend time. You have to be prepared to spend time to understand the culture properly, particularly India, because it is so complex. So I feel for most cross-cultural people, or most people wanting to work across a culture, you have to follow the process, the cultural process, which is acceptance, of the fact that there are differences, understanding that these differences may have value, appreciating the differences for what value they bring. It gives you a sense of who you are compared to others, like fish in the water. You recognize your strengths and your weaknesses compared to somebody else's. You learn to adapt. You learn, once you learn to adapt, you build relationships. Once you build relationships, new opportunities present themselves. And when everybody starts benefiting from the new opportunities, you embrace cultural diversity. So it's a process. And it starts with that first step, which is acceptance. Acceptance is often a very, very difficult thing to do. So a cultural savvy, that means a person who understands cross-cultural issues, you understand the differences between individuals and a group. You understand how cultures understand that difference, how cultures behave whether they behave more individualistically or they behave more as a collective. You have to be open-minded to differences, but you must not let biases take hold of your, of your behavior. You must be adaptable and be able to accept changing realities. And that's how you win business in India. So we're looking at six, all cultures, Hofstede's six-dimensional model, very quickly so that you have a conceptual framework. Um, 
there are six dimensions or six cultural characteristics that every culture has. One is the relationship to hierarchy uh, versus equality. One is the, uh, whether a person or a mindset is more individualist or it depend, depends on others for its definition of life, for support, for loyalty, etc. Performance and caring versus mass is performance and caring, masculinity versus a more uh, sort of uh, uh, gentler approach, performance versus caring, uncertainty avoidance, which is dealing with ambiguity or the unknown and functioning within that environment. Uh, flexibility and discipline, which is long-term orientation, LTO. I'll go through all of these. And indulgence versus restraint. I will walk you through each of them. How we use it is we have scores. We have numbers. As you can see across the screen, we have 77 India scores in power distance, 48 in individualism. This is on a scale from 0 to 100, uh, 56 in masculinity, 40 in and So we have a tool that you can use to understand the cultural differences. It's the only system as far as I'm aware, that actually quantifies human behavior in this manner. And what does this do for you? Well, you can compare different countries. So for example, here I've compared France, Germany, India, and the Netherlands on these six dimensions. So you can compare a nation, for example, let's say you take 68 is the score of France, and 77 is the score of India in the dimension of hierarchy. That means India is more hierarchical than France is, but if they are close, they understand the concept of hierarchy, there's a top-down approach, etc. Yet, if you look at the other two countries in the comparison, Germany and the Netherlands, you see that they are much lower in power distance or much lower. That means they're more, they're more egalitarian countries. So when you have a country which is high power distance working with a country which is low power distance, you can understand that there's going to be a difference in the way people think. And so by using these tools, you can strategize and you can adapt and you can plan how to do business in India, particularly if you come from a country where you are different in the scores. The differences matter the most. So moving on, you can compare, like for example here, I've shown just to take power again as an example, the differences in this case are a little less between uh, Germany, Netherlands, and India. This case, they are tremendously higher. Uh, and the two countries are Denmark and Sweden. So there is a difference that can be, and that impact is on how intense the behavior patterns are. So as you understand that, let's go through uh, uh, the, the various dimensions. I have very little time, but I will do it as fast as I can. So we have a very high score on power, uh, power distance. That's the hierarchy. It is accepted and expected. It is normal. It is good. It is expected that there is a senior person or there is a person with rank and status, and that person will determine what you do, what you don't do. Subordinates defer to their bosses, and the boss is supposed to look after their needs. This is the mindset. Therefore, direction is required. And you have to show that you are capable of leading. You are sure that you are the boss. Now, we have a rule here. The boss is always right, even when he's wrong. So this is power distance. The other dimension, the second dimension is individualism, collectivism. That means do you think more as an individual or a smaller, is your focus a small uh, a dot versus a wider concept? So if you imagine for a moment, envision a flower, there's a center and there are many petals, right? So in collectivist societies, each petal is an in-group. It's a circle of influence that influences the way you think, okay? So your life is defined by your relationship to the multiple in-groups that you are part of, whereas in an individualist society, it's very much more focused on the core. This is something to understand when you talk about individualism, collectivism. When you take these two dimensions together, for instance, in India, it's that in India, personal and business relationships tend to intertwine. There are no clear defining boundaries. You could call up somebody in the middle of the night and they would be there to help you because that's part of building the relationship. So establishing, and this is a key point, establishing a personal relationship, showing that you are dependable, you are part of the group, is when you can actually do proper business with people here because you have invested time getting to know them and you have invested time and effort in building a relationship. Respect the hierarchy build a relationship. This is critical to work in this country. 
Another dimension is called masculine femininity. India has a medium or high score masculine, which means our society values symbols of success and achievement. In several other cultures, it's more focused on how comfortably everyone can work together. Uh, I think in, in, in Dutch, it's called chazalak, if I've got the pronunciation right. And in German, I think it's called chemutik. And, and that sort of indicates to you the difference in, in a more masculine society, it's the symbols of success, it's achievement, it's winning the business. So being on the cusp, we're not exactly too high or too low in a middle score, it's likely that people will work very fervently behind the scenes to win. Yet, on the surface, it will be projected as a scene of unity and across groups and segments, there should be harmony. Now, another concept is when you are dealing in India, which is masculine price is a critical factor not only because you want we're we're, we're cheap and we want a good deal uh it's it we might be that too but it's not it's not only that it's important to win but it's important to win at the best possible price or the best possible terms or the best possible deal because it's a huge boost to the image and the status and for an indian it's a real high to be able to get a damn good deal and that comes from being mass, masculine. So be prepared to have a very good price point, a very good offer, and building flexibility into your position so that you have negotiation space. It's very important. Uh, you won't go into a meeting and get everything done in the first shot. It's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of back and forth. It's going to be a lot of changing realities. You have to be flexible. That is very, very important. The dimension that I'm about to talk of, the characteristic I'm about to talk of now is perhaps one of the most important because it has, we have a medium score in uncertainty avoidance. I mean, our country is comfortable with a certain degree of ambiguity in everyday life. There are other cultures that are very uncomfortable with, with ambiguity and they develop systems and processes uh, to see that everything is perfectly planned. In our society, we can work with a little bit of ambiguity. We're okay with it. We don't, get, we don't get completely out of sync if things are not absolutely perfect. So process perfectionists are going to have, have a little bit of trouble. They're also going to have some reluctant at best buy-in from Indians because Indians are not completely 100% sold on the concept of being 100% process-oriented. Okay, so we'll keep one eye on your process, of course. But we'll also be scanning for a loophole or a shortcut, which is not likely to cause any trouble or bring the roof down, but it's something that fulfills all the necessary requirements, yet get the job done, and that is called the chalta hai, or it'll do. It's not perfect, but it'll do. Chalta hai is a local term, which means it'll do, we'll manage, it'll be okay, let's move on. So some, in, some, some visual, uh, if you just imagine, queue jumping, which is something that Indians have had to deal with for a long time, people cutting queues, which are not something that you do in most uh, Western cultures that easily without being fired or scolded and shouted at or something like that. But queue jumping, uh, not following rules and regulations, our chaotic driving conditions in Indian cities, these are all indications of this particular dimension. What is also very, very important is this dimension is what makes us flexible. It's what makes us nimble. Uh, it makes us work when things are not 100% perfect, but move on and we'll find a way through the problem. So this, this leads to sort of innovative ways of dealing with red tape. It, uh, and, and we have lots of that here. Indians have gone through this for, for, for se uh, what, 60 years, 70 years. We've been going through these processes of red tape sometimes uh, archaic laws and rules, there's a workaround, somebody smart has developed a workaround, and sometimes when you're very process-oriented, people get a little uncomfortable with that, be prepared for it. And uh, be prepared to have trust uh, in your Indian partner uh, to, to choose uh, the process that, he that he's going to follow. Uh, of course, I cannot, with the full conscience, uh, tell you to throw caution to the wind and say, let them do anything they want. No, that's not very safe. But in small things, in certain paperwork or in certain uh, rules and regulations, if the Indian is confident there's a safe workaround, then you have to let him uh, do it. And it also builds 
relationship and trust because the partner sees that okay you have the faith in him to 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 accept that he's telling you this is the way it should be done so uh, coming to the final one and i have a few minutes more uh, india is a medium to high score in long term orientation and we have a low score for indulgence i take these two dimensions together because they they work together very well um for example we have shunned credit cards for ages to recently because the central philosophy was own it when you can afford it this is a long term thinking uh, versus you know the immediate requirement for 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 obtaining something or or gratifying your needs that's the indulgent side of it which is relatively low we are more restrained culture so of course now things have changed credit is becoming the norm but yet indians spend a lot of time on planning their future their retirement their saving processes um, it's not it's not like many uh, western societies where there's really only one instrument uh, that sort of takes care of your retirement like a pension or this indians will make multiple ones because they want to be safe they want to hedge um, decisions are taken with a longer term perspective uh, life strategy involves gradual acquisition of assets another very interesting concept about uh, uh both the dimension uncertainty avoidance and long term orientation as well as indulgence and restraint is arranged marriages um arranged marriages in india are pretty much the norm about 75% of indians prefer this is an important word prefer arranged marriages okay so this this particular thing uh, shows you the kar- karmic philosophy that this is destined this that we are fatalistic people this is destined this is planned this will happen there will be certain hiccups along the way but eventually we will find our way if we are destined to be together and so on and so forth what does that have an implication on you in terms of your business you have to understand that time is not a concept that indians take as seriously as many countries in the west time is not linear it is cyclic so we are more fatalistic in the sense that we will believe that well if something didn't happen exactly to plan that was destined it's not a big deal what has to happen will happen so as one culturist put it uh, indians believe in what will be will be but with a lot of divine intervention so for fruitful cooperation and i hand it over to divya in a second fruitful cooperation with indians relationships critical uh be prepared for bureaucracy because we have a complicated power distance kind of environment here but you have to be able to be flexible nimble and you have to understand that we are lower on uncertainty avoidance than a lot of western countries we know where the light bends so to speak when in our country we will figure out how to work together expect negotiations to be hard mad india is addicted to a good deal invest heavily in personal relationship it's very 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 important you cannot do anything without building that first and respect the hierarchy because sometimes a person at your level does not have the authority that you have and that should not reflect on their integrity or their ability to take a decision it's just that they perhaps cannot so be open right win a business assignment goes hand in hand with winning trust and building relationships uh be prepared to have nothing close in the first few meetings it's a process more than a moment that will define success find the network it's there sometimes the power holder is not visible he could be hidden you need to find out the network okay we are collectivist and we're competitive we're price competitive so i will now hand over to my colleague divya susan who will take the rest of the session thank you very much very much nadir i think you've laid a great foundation for the rest of the webinar um of course everybody this is going to be a tangential shift from uh the information uh, nadir has given of course he's laid a very strong foundation for what i'm going to cover from now on um and most of his um discussions were about business to business settings business to business communications and now i'm going to shift from that to business to end customer communications for those of you who are looking to expand your markets to india in terms of consumer needs and behavior um of course the many indias that nadir talks about it's not an exaggeration it's the blatant truth 
with 1.3 billion people with religious linguistic diversity. Um, and what you will see is also the socioeconomic diversity that exists. So when you're talking about your end customer, it's very important to keep in mind who that is, which geographical area and which socioeconomic class they belong to. And this is very important to lay the foundation, this particular um, statistics here. Uh, if you look at the um, 1985 bar graph, it shows 93% of the Indian population were amongst the poorest, which means annually um, per household, they would have less than 1,200 euros as an income. And three decades down the line, that blue graph that you see over there has come down to 35%. We still have 43% poor, which is anywhere between 1,200 to 2,500 euros per annum per family, per household. But then the consumers that we're really looking at are the ones that are represented in yellow, the dark blue, and the light green which is expected to represent about 42% of the Indian population by 2025. And we're well on our way to that, though we had last year a little bit of a, a slowdown um, after the demonetization process happened. Uh, but five days ago, there was a report that India is back on track with a 7.3% GDP growth, um, which uh, puts us as the fastest growing economy ahead of China currently. So really, this is the segment of the population you should be looking at in terms of consumer behavior. And this following uh, slide I show you to really help you understand who I will be talking about when I take you through consumer behavior and needs. Uh, we will be talking a lot about the urban mass because unlike China, most of India's consumerism is in the urban mass because simply because that's the most populous. Uh, segment of the population and the aggregate income is extremely high there. The urban middle and the movers and shakers, as we call it, also contribute to a large extent to the consumerism that exists here. Um, I will also be using the terms affluent to describe the urban middle and the movers and shakers, the aspirers to um, describe the urban mass and the rural mass to some extent, and deprived. So be very careful, like Nadir said, on who you are targeting as an end customer because your marketing efforts, your positioning, product positioning will highly depend on who you are selling to. The next slide shows how the global middle class is emerging. Um, and in 2020, and this is an OECD Development Center report, in 2020, it's predicted that 11% of spending uh, by the global middle class will be from Indians, and that's going to go up to 23% uh, to, to in 2030, which is a huge piece of the pie, um, and good reason to um, set your eyes on India right away. And also we're going to be, in 2030, uh, less than the average population is going to be less than 35 years old. So that's also a huge market to tap. Where is India, where are the Indian consumers really spending their money? So as the wealth has been increasing, you see that the discretionary spending has gone up, um, primarily in healthcare, in education and recreation, in communication, hugely in transportation, in personal products and services and household products. And so this healthcare, education, recreation, simply because of our very young population and transportation, um, going to be huge industries in the future for India to have your eyes on. So what does this mean based on some of the cultural determinants that Nadir spoke about? And putting in mind, keeping in mind the fact that just, you know, just over 30 years ago, um, and that's not very far away, I remember, and I'm, I'm pretty young, I remember an India where all these products were not available. Where I can remember when exactly some of these products came into the market and when it was affordable and when we started taking for granted that, okay, there are supermarkets that give out these products, it was not always available. 
So keeping in mind that it did not, it wasn't very long ago that we did not have many choices, um, the, the uh, companies need to understand that setting yourself apart, this newly gained wealth, showing your status and position is a huge determinant in, uh, in, in consumer behavior, in com consumer choices and motivations. So the aspirers and the affluent, the top pyramid, the top of the pyramid that I showed you, really look at, okay, what is our choice when regards to consumer durable, when it comes to automobiles, when it comes to lifestyle products? How does this set us apart from the rest of the population? How does it show our status and our position in society? And of course, like Nadir said, there is also this regard for, I need a good deal as well. So when you come, uh, when you talk about fast moving consumer goods, it's still value for money. For products that are bought on a daily basis, it's still, oh, there's a sale going on. You know, we need to hoard on whatever is available, the clothes for the season or, or the, the things that we, products that we use on a daily basis. So the sales and good deals are always welcome for, especially the aspirers uh, segment of this. Interestingly, what we see right now is also a shift towards natural products. Uh, and this is amongst the affluent simply because organic products are still extremely expensive in India. Natural products are extremely expensive. So the rural mass is still not able to afford that. This would be in the rural middle and the movers and shakers that they're moving towards natural products. Interesting case study here though, because I cannot talk about consumer behavior in India without taking up the case study of Patanjali, which is taken the Indian uh, FMCG market by storm. The backstory is that the guy on your screen, Baba Ramdev, um, he attained celebrity status as a guru, as a yoga guru, by having his um, show, yoga show on regional television channels first thing in the morning. So he would talk about healthy living, he would talk about the right way to do yoga, the right uh, foods to eat, etc. And in the 1990s, he set up this company called Patanjali, where he had already um, gotten this thought leader, this, this uh, guru status. And when the guru now came up with a brand, uh, which obviously was trustworthy because he's the guru, um, and a brand that sold everything from food items to beauty products to Ayurvedic supplements to everything that the Indian consumer is looking for, uh, and slashed it to about 15 to 30 percent cheaper than what was available in the market. Immediately, it was available to the masses, the rural and the urban masses in India. How did he tap the top le level of the pyramid? He said it was 100 percent natural. It's taken from indigenous ingredients. It's going back to the Vedic times, he claimed. He talks about how the ingredients, the recipes that he used were, um, you know, spoke, spoken about in the Vedas in the, and, the, and in the Upanishads, which you, if you see uh, the Indian society, it's very, uh, it looks back for wisdom, it looks back to ancient wisdom a lot, which appeals to all the segments of the population. And of course, the made in India and made for the Indians had really, really sold. So what do you see in Patanjali is this. This was the tremendous growth that this company had since 2010. And from 2000, the year ending 2016 to the year ending 2017, it was five times a growth uh, in sales. And that figure over there of 10,561 uh, 10, crores in sales would be approximately 1.3 billion euros in sales in the year ending 2017. Of course, the projected sales were supposed to be 2.5 billion euros this year. That the year ends March 31st here in India. So we're yet to see if this really happened or not. But you can see how tremendous this growth is when compared to any case study that you've seen. What did Patanjali do right? Number one, the power distance. The fact that there was a leader the fact, uh, the, the fact that there was a guru up there who people could trust and rely on, looked up to, talking about, and he was the sole brand ambassador. He ca came out there, won people's trust, and said, hey, this is what I am endorsing. It's my company. I, I guarantee the uh, quality of the product, and people, the masses bought it. 
He slashed down the prices, Indians like a good deal. Also the rural masses, it was possible for them to access this, to afford it, huge sales. And he also made these stores available in different parts of India, not just the cities. There were stores in tier two and tier three towns and villages where people could really go to the stores and pick up a Patanjali product. It's also available online. There is a Patanjali website where you can order your, um, your supplies. It's available in supermarkets. It's available everywhere. So accessibility was easy uh, to the Indian consumer. Um, higher up the pyramid, the, the consumers were really attracted by the fact that, well, this is made in India, made for the Indians. Um, Patanjali flatly refused any foreign direct investment in the company and uh, also the fact that it's 100% natural or claimed to be 100% natural was a big seller. So to understand the consumer psyche of India, this, this case study is extremely important because it combined all those very important values of the Indian consumer and ended up carpet bombing uh, almost the entire Indian market. Going to marketing, and of course, this has to be seen in light of what we have already spoken about consumer behavior. And here, I'm not going to touch upon the traditional marketing strategies like newspaper advertisements or television advertisements or hoardings. Still exist, still work in India. But what I'm going to talk about more are the digital marketing trends that exist in India. Um, India has a, 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 an internet penetration of about 460 million internet users, which is projected to be around 635 million by 2021. And there are currently about 300 million smartphone users in India. So now the brands are really shifting from, I'm the brand and I, this is what I offer you, to how can we be more human in our sales? We're talking about social media influencer campaigns where popular people on social media, those who have a certain number of followers who have a certain credibility on social media are being used to speak about their experiences using a particular product, which works simply very much like a brand ambassador, except that in this case, the brand ambassador is not a celebrity. It's a person like you and I, and it's just that they have a large social media circle and we rely on them for um, information and they, um, you, you know, they endorse a the product, so it must be good. So the collective nature of India really comes through here that, oh, a person like you and I, he's selling or he's endorsing this product, so he must be right. SEO continues to be a very important thing for companies to do because everything's online. Whatever product you want to go for, everything searched, Googled or for reviews for this particular product. So SEO is definitely uh, worth investing in. Aggregator apps, everything is an app right now. Uh, whether you want to order your groceries online, whether you want to compare insurance policies, whether you want to order food. For example, there is an app called Swiggy, uh, which you uh, open the app and it detects the location that you're at. It turns up all the restaurants in your area, including their menu and the price for each food. And then you simply have to click on whatever you want and somebody delivers it at your doorstep. Everything is on an app and everything that's simple and convenient sells with the Indian consumer, including the urban masses and the um, urban elite in India. I don't have to say much about video advertising. I know all of you who have experienced it it's everywhere on YouTube, on Facebook. It's annoying for the end user, of course, but as a marketer, it's an effective strategy because you really can't escape it. Another very popular marketing trend, and it is gaining, uh, it has gained popularity and it's supposed to triple uh, till 2025, is multi level marketing, where people simply, and if you think about it, it's the collective uh, and relationship oriented culture in India that says, well, I'm using this product, this, this makeup from Avon, if you will, and I'm going to talk to my circle of friends and my family about how I like it. And then they are going to use it because I endorsed it. And through them purchasing it, I get a discount and so on and so forth. So it goes, it spreads like wildfire, especially if you have a large social circle and you have everything to gain. You get a good deal and you're working on your relationships to actually um, sell the product. 
Another very interesting marketing trend is experiential marketing, uh, where brands go out there and create experiences for their cu customers. Now, the experience has nothing, n not necessarily anything to do with the product itself. It's just the fact that a company sets up a stall in a popular area. It could be a mall, it could be a park, and they could have quizzes or talent shows or, you know, people jumping off in a fake bird, uh, you know, just, just to have an experience. Um, and this creates top of the mind recall for the brand. This is also extremely popular in India. To conclude on this, convenience. Convenience is key in the Indian market right now, especially in tier one and tier two cities because people simply cannot be bothered to step out into the traffic, which is ever increasing in Indian cities. Um, sit for hours on a road, uh, shop, and then stand in a long queue to make purchases. Everything is online. So the more your products are available online, the easier it is to sell them. You have everything delivered at your doorstep, including your daily groceries, including your kids' clothes, including your clothes, including even the bank. They actually deliver or collect checks from your doorstep now. Um, we even have the case of Amazon Wardrobe, which I don't know if it started yet. I haven't checked that yet. I should. Uh, where they send you an entire wardrobe of clothes of your choice to your doorstep. You try them on and you choose whatever you like and you get the rest to be picked up from your doorstep another day. So it's not only that you can order and people deliver to your doorstep, you have the choice of paying cash when they deliver um, or you can use your debit or uh, uh, credit card. You can use net banking. Another app, aggregator app, is Paytm, where you pay through your cell phone. And if you're unhappy with the product, you get them uh, picked up at your doorstep too. Influence of a thought leader works in India. Uh, people want to know what a thought leader has, thinks about a particular product, as we've seen with the social media influencer campaigns. The experience matters for an Indian. It creates top of the mind recall. And the, the more status it gives an Indian to purchase your product, the better they are or the more they're going to adopt that product. That is about the um, marketing aspect. Again, another tangential shift. I'm going to move to now B2B or business to business and setting up meetings in India. We have about 10 minutes. Uh, and I'm going to end this in time so that we open up for questions from um, all of you. Here it's very important when you're setting up a meeting in India as to determine who you're going to approach vis-a-vis -vis your relative position. Because if you're part of a company and you want to approach somebody in a, in a potential partner or company, uh, you need to first of all aim for the top because the decisions are made on the top in India. You may find the junior level people more approachable. You may find it easy to contact them and get a commitment from them, but no decision is really going to be made at that level. So what you're trying to do is approach the top level management. Um, but if you are a junior person in a company and you try to approach a top level manager, it's probably not going to happen. So you need to start with your peer or one step ahead of you and try to work yourself up that ladder. Like Nadir said, it's important to have a lot of clarity on the value you're adding. What is the, what is the deal you can provide them? How are you going to give them a win in terms of the value you bring, in terms of the um, you know, cost you can negotiate on, et cetera? Easiest way to set up a meeting in India is through contacts. If you have contacts, who will put you to the top guy? That's the best surest, easiest way, the sh most short, shortest of routes to um, get access to a company. Uh, but also, you know, when you get in touch with the chambers of commerce in your own country, uh, when you get approach companies like Swissnext, that helps because uh, they've already established a network that you can go through to reach that company. And if you have uh, reached the right person that you, you wanted to reach, and you have a confirmation in your, uh, on your meeting, be, be very mindful that a meeting is not confirmed until you reconfirm it. For example, if you set a meeting with um, somebody one month from now 
and they say, yes, let's meet one month from now, it's not confirmed till you reconfirm it somewhere in between now and, and that date. And then also before you book your tickets, if you're coming all the way from Europe, please reconfirm that the meeting is really happening at that particular time. It's not confirmed just because somebody said a yes. Um, like I said, aim for the top level management. Um, if you, uh, when you get to the meeting, prepare that, with, like Nadia said, Indians have a very cyclical view of time. Prepare to wait. A 9 a.m. may not be 9 a.m. Um, you, you will probably need to wait till the boss gets in as well. And most decisions are not made uh, on the first meeting. Probably with young startup companies, with a young management, with young people, things are a little quicker. You know, people may start on time and decisions are made quicker, but uh, typically you should expect several rounds of meetings before a decision is arrived at. In terms of dressing, formality is best. Um, Indian wear is always appreciated, but don't go overboard with Indian wear, as is the case with a recent visit from Dustin Trudeau, um, who was heavily criticized and mocked for uh, you know, overdoing the Indian dressing, it, it almost was like he was attending an Indian wedding every day. So if, if you want to, I know a lot of Westerners want to come here and try on Indian clothing, do tone it down. We have a lot of jazzy colors, which, which we usually use for weddings and not for business meetings. So tone it down. And in for the future meetings, of course, you can mirror what your counterpart is, is uh, you know, the style of your counterpart, and that would be fine. Um, greetings, you typically uh, exchange a handshake uh, in tier one cities. If it's a woman, do wait, and if you're a man, do wait till uh, she offers you a hand else um, a namaste. It's very good. Um, and as a foreigner, you will be given and treated with a lot of hospitality, regardless of your position, simply because you're a guest in the country. So prepare for a lot of invitations um, after the meetings for uh, they may invite you home, they may invite you to dinner, all these things can happen. It's just a process of relationship building that you should embrace and consider it as a positive thing. Um, addressing people, it's always safe to address as a mister or a miss, especially if you're meeting with people who are much older than you are, or in terms of seniority in, in, in role, or seniority in terms of age, because it's considered disrespectful to call a person by their first name. Uh, if that person is extremely um, senior. Of course, if you have an invitation to uh, call them by their first name, then that's fine, then it makes it safe to do so. Small talk is a big thing here in India. Most meetings will start with a lot of small talk. So those, these are some of the topics you can safely talk about. You know, the, uh, your curiosity about India, the food, cricket, Bollywood movies, family. So meetings typically start with a lot of small talk before you really get into the crux of things. Of course, I can't state this enough. Uh, just because you had a successful meeting and just because you had an agreement on something does not mean anything unless you follow up with an email thanking them and enlisting the action items from your end as well as from their end. And even though you've done that, don't expect that it will magically get done. Um, following up, I know, for a lot of Western minds means that you don't trust the person or trust the person's words. Uh, whereas here in India, following up simply means that you are very serious about that business partnership, that you're really truly interested and that you consider it very important. So uh, when you're not follow up, it may be seen as well, you know, the person was not interested after all. So, you know, it, it may, may or may not happen. So following up on action items, um, making a few calls, sending a few emails means that you're really serious about the business partnership you're looking at. Finally, five key takeaways from the whole webinar. As Nadir said, it's a land of contrast. Uh, everything that you say about India, the opposite is always true as well. So never assume based on anything you've heard, anything you've read, don't assume. Do always reconfirm because India is a dynamic society, it's fast changing. So something that existed 10 years ago may not necessarily be true right now because cause of our growing middle class as well and an extremely young population. So do reconfirm in terms of style of working, in terms of what the preference is, in terms of communication, etc. Um, two things that always
ask my clients to pack in their suitcase patients, plenty of patients, because things don't really happen um, in the time that you want it to happen, and flexibility because it does not happen the way you want it to happen. So if you have these two characteristics, you'll probably have a little more stamina to last in, in India. Um, even after attending this webinar, reading articles, reading books, asking with Indians, do take the time to observe, ask, and learn because, as I mentioned, it's fast changing, it's extremely dynamic, it's extremely diverse, so it really depends on who you're dealing with here. Um, generally, in India, relationships are very important. They trump merit, um, which means that you see a lot of nepotistic tendencies here in India. But also because of our highly masculine, not highly masculine, borderline masculine, but thanks to our recently developed wealth and our ever um, important need to go up the socioeconomic ladder, that kind of sometimes trumps relationships, so you need to be wary of that as well. I've said this twice, I'm saying it again, follow up, because it's important in India, you may take for granted that we have an agreement, but nothing is an agreement unless you follow up and show that it is important. Um, that's my five key takeaways, and I open the floor to questions right now. Um, we are, we've finished on the dot of an hour, and I open the floor to questions. Either, oh, I get a message saying there's no audio. Can everybody hear me, or was I talking to myself? Okay, great, great. I think it's just this one particular gentleman here uh, who couldn't hear me. Uh, so you can type in your questions in the chat box and we'll be happy to answer them between Nadir and I. Nadir, you need to unmute your microphone for this. Maybe you can take this one. Okay, just a second. Am I am I able to be heard right now? Yes, yeah. you are. Okay, let me just have a quick look at the question. I have to change. Maybe I read it out for you. Is, uh, a, yeah. is it person? safe for me to yeah. go to India for business? And how do you handle disagreements with Indian partners? Okay, um, uh, is it safe? Uh, sure. Um, you know. Uh, Safe in what respect? Are you asking me, is it safe? Uh, first of all, are you uh, male, female? Sorry, I didn't see that. Could you, could you clarify that? Um, is the question from a lady or a gentleman? Okay. Um, well, I know Divya would probably be able to answer this as well, but from the perspective of a male, 99.9% um, .9 yes, you are safe, probably 100% you are safe. Uh, of course, uh, it depends on what you do and where you go that also makes a difference. Um, for example, if you're here for business and you stay in a decent hotel and you have decent business partners uh, and uh, I, I don't see any problem at all in terms of safety. Um, if you are outside in some sort of uh, uh, sort of non-urban area, or you've gone to some isolated location on your own, unaccompanied, um, I can't say that anything will happen. But the occasional, I'm sorry to say, idiot exists in uh, in any location, and you might come across uh, uh, people like that which is unfortunate, but it does happen. And 
to some extent, there are colleagues of mine, friends of mine, family members who are ladies who've always felt that they get strange looks and uh, they get uncomfortable and there is a certain degree of sexism and there is a certain degree of, uh, um, of, of bad behavior. But most of the time, I would say, um, uh, people are very safe and uh, make sure you are in a, not in an isolated location alone unaccompanied. Uh, as a young lady, I think we should be all right. Divya, would you would you be able to add things to that, please? Yes, um, I, I think as a young Indian woman, I um, echo Nadir's sentiments uh, to a, a certain extent. Of course, when you are on a business trip and uh, when you are in a business setting, it's absolutely safe. Um, but I always exercise caution no matter where I am, whether it's in India or um, yeah. I remember traveling to Finland and knowing that Helsinki is one of the safest cities in the world and yet um, exercising caution because, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's as simple as using your common sense um, in, in uh, wherever you go because if you're going to find yourself in an isolated place, um, if you are inebriated or something, because it's going to be unsafe for anybody. Um, so exercise caution, exercise your common sense wherever you go. Uh, it's not utterly unsafe. If you are um, European and if you, uh, you will stand out uh, thanks to maybe if you have blonde hair or if, if you're different looking from the average Indian, uh, you can expect to have a few stares your way. People do look inappropriately, which is uncomfortable even for me as an Indian woman. Um, I, I, I learn to ignore it. Uh, I've also heard from a lot of um, Western expatriates here that people tend to come and ask you if they can take a selfie with you. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. It's just I'm that good. they're showing you their curiosity and their interest in curiosity. you. But you feel free to refuse. If it makes you uncomfortable, feel free to refuse and say, I'm not comfortable with that, or a straight no, um, that's absolutely okay. So the, um, the most you can feel unsafe is through looks you will get on the streets. And this, this ask for a selfie or trying to make conversation. Uh, but if you're out alone at night, do exercise caution because it's it's um, it's better to be safe than sorry here in India. Um, Divya, there's another question, an interesting one, uh, from uh, um, a participant who says um, we are a small SME in Sweden, mm -hmm. and in our company we have no titles. Mm -hmm. Does that matter? Yeah. Uh, you spoke about reaching to a person at the same level as you. Does it mean that you have a title? Is it important? Okay. Uh, can I just uh, answer that and then I'll hand it over to Divya. Um, one point is I would say that uh, designations and titles are very important in India because it's extremely important that somebody uh, sees that a person with authority or a person with with knowledge or a person with the capability to make a decision has come to meet them. So yes, I would say designations are necessary. Um, uh, as far as reaching out to the person at your level, I think that Divya was saying that if you can aspire to try and hit the highest level that you can possibly reach, uh, no matter what your level is, the highest you can possibly reach. And that would be restrained by your designation, that would be restrained by the authority that you have to make a decision that would also be restrained by uh, who you know and, and what contacts you can use uh, to be able to get as high as you can in the hierarchy. So I think that's what she meant. But please, uh, Divya, if there's anything you want to add to that. Right. Again, uh, as with everything in India, you need to know exactly who you're targeting. If you're targeting a traditional Indian company, uh, then you need to be very cautious about what, at least, cook up a designation for you because people won't take you seriously otherwise. But if you are targeting a young Indian company, an entrepreneurial Indian company, uh, they're also trying to do away with these titles, so they may be a little more forgiving and flexible with regards to this. So really, you need to see what the management level people, people are, what the demographics of the management level people are, what the company is into. If it's a young, dynamic company, you really have nothing to worry about. But if it's a traditional Indian company, yes, uh, your title will be important. 
Um, Nadir, there is one more question that we missed. How do you handle oh, disagreements with Indian partners? Do oh, I'm sorry that? about that. Yeah. Uh, where is that? Yes. How do you handle disagreements with Indian partners? Lots of patience, um, lots of flexibility, and try, as difficult as it may be, to actually understand their point of view. One of the things that you might incur, uh, incur is a, a, a situation where communication is not 100% clear. Uh, so the point they may be trying to make, the, the choice of words, the sentence structure, may not exactly communicate the underlying issue, which actually may have merit in terms of their reservations or their side of it. Very often, I have also fallen into this trap in just normal negotiation with people thinking, what, what nonsense are they bringing up? What kind of a silly thing are they talking about? But when you stop for a moment and say, okay, just put the communication issues aside, try and understand what he's saying, you'll find that there normally is some reason behind the reservation. Otherwise, they're very eager to close the deal also. You see, we're a mass culture, so we want to, we want to succeed. People will not unnecessarily put uh, impediments in, in part. Uh, they, will, they will have a reason for, and trying to find that reason and provide a solution for it. it so it takes patience and, and, and open-mindedness to see what they're saying. I'm not saying that everything they say is right or everything that someone uh, disagrees with you is correct. I'm just saying that you have to be able to keep your mind open and try and really get to the bottom of what uh, they're really uh, uh, disagreeing about. Just one more point on this very same thing, which is a little deeper in terms of communication, and Divya is an expert in communication. We have an implicit communication style. That means things that are said, uh, things that are the most important are sometimes not said. So you have to know to read between the lines. Somebody might be raising an issue about something that you're having a disagreement with, but maybe that's not the real reason behind them dragging their feet in closing the deal. So that flexibility and open-mindedness and understanding the culture is very, very important in terms of a disagreement. And where we're we concerned, a disagreement doesn't mean that the deal is over. A disagreement is nothing but a process of, uh, you know, perhaps even an opportunity to, to overcome and make a stronger relationship. And that's happened many, many times too. When you go into a company or you go into a business deal and you just can't agree on anything and then when you go out and have a couple of drinks and then you meet the next time and suddenly you can find a solution to a problem and then that becomes something that's like a, 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 a leaping point for you to go to another level in the relationship. So look at it as a possibly, possibly an opportunity to develop a deeper relationship. Divya, sorry. Please, please take it from here. I think you've uh, said it all, Nadir, except for the uh, di indirect communication, the in implicit communication. It's something that bothers a lot of Westerners who come into India yes. because it simply isn't very clear what an Indian is trying to say. Um, Indians find it extremely difficult to say a no. Um, it's very, very difficult for people to say a no or um, say directly what they mean to say. They, they hope that you will read between the lines and try to understand what you're trying to say. And we're experts at that. We're, we, even if there is nothing to read between the lines, we're always trying to read between the lines, even when we're talking to somebody else. So it is an art, really, um, because uh, something that we consider, and we're, we're, because of our extreme diversity, we're taught early on to be polite, to not offend anybody. And being polite, in our case, sometimes is translated to dishonesty in Western cultures. Whereas um, the honesty that Western cultures come with uh, are looked at, at as rude here in India. So yes. do exercise caution in your communication style. Um, it, uh, handling conflicts is, is, can be complex because of the indirect communication style, but otherwise it is, like Nadir said, a room to improve your um, relationship with the person. We have another question, um, Nadir, if you want to start off on this. Is it necessary to personally visit India if you want to do business there? Okay, it's a good question, an excellent question, because when you are an SME uh, or a smaller company, you have constraints on budgets. We don't have travel budgets like, uh, like larger organizations do. We 
don't have personnel that we can deploy for a long period of time to various locations. I fully understand, I fully, uh, fully appreciate that question. And I will say that uh, in order to make that decision, you will have to first develop your relationship online, as you suggest, telephone calls, emails, communication, exchanging price lists, exchanging product specifications, many discussions perhaps. Uh, before you come to a point where you say, yes, I think I want to go ahead with this business and I think I want to move ahead with these people and then I would most certainly recommend uh, a visit because there's nothing like a face-to-face -face and there's nothing like, uh, you know, unless it's a one-way transaction. For example, somebody's buying something from you and if the Indian customer, for instance, is very comfortable just putting his money down online or sending you a line of credit or whatever it is, and you know you're, you just have to ship the goods, and they're willing to do that. Yeah, that's fine. But if you're going to have a longer relationship, which has a sort of two-way street, where there's some exchange of raw material, maybe the, the return of a finished product, or the development of a service, or selling into the market, using them as your agent or your partner or something like that. Yes, I would recommend uh, because you know. Um, you know Bollywood, yes, and the word Bollywood. Yeah, we 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 can do a lot of smoke and mirrors. We can do a lot of showboating, and and uh, we're, we're good with showbiz. So what you see on the website or what you see on the telephonic con, I mean the the video con, could be something completely quite different when you actually land there and say, oh, this is the operation. So and and vice versa. Uh, somebody small in a small town may not be able to speak very clearly. May, may not dress very well, may not be articulate, may look like he has a sort of, no, not so great a setting, but when you come there and you see what they do, and you see their skill, and you see the capability, it's a whole different perspective. So on both sides, I would say, initially develop the relationship virtually, and then budget in time and investment to come and visit personally, and really see what, depending upon your business, of course, uh, and the value of your business, uh, come and come and try and visit. Yes, it, it can always help. That's how I see it. Divya, I think I, I agree with that. I think uh, is it necessary? No, but is it recommended? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it would always be better if you do that personal visit because um, since relationships are important here, uh, it helps to see the human side of the person you're dealing with. Um, rather than somebody who is remotely there. And it's easier to uh, take for granted, take for a ride a person who's remotely there and you don't have any personal relationship with. So it's not necessary, it can still function, but it's uh, recommended to visit. Any more questions? Do we still have time for questions, Celia? I've not received any more questions. We can always take questions on email if Celia puts up the, the, yeah. the emails. Uh, Divya and I can definitely answer. Um, and you can ask questions on the Kubin platform. There is a follow-up right. section and there's a dedicated discussion for that webinar, so you can ask any question and we'll forward them to Divya and Nadir. Excellent. There's also a lot of documents that have been written actually by Divya and Nadir on the Cubin platform. So if you want to read more about India and learn more, you can uh, connect to the Cubin platform to have access to a lot of documents. And we'll also put the um, recording of that session in there. Uh, if there are no other questions, I, I'd just like to thank Celia and uh, for all your arrangements and uh, Divya for an excellent presentation and all of you who have joined us, thank you for sparing the time and I hope Divya and I have given you some insights and some sort of um, um, you know, knowledge on India and we would be very happy to take any questions in the future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nadir. Thank you, Celia. Thank you for everybody who's joined us today. Of course, um, like we reiterate, India is an extremely complicated market and uh, what we've tried to do is point you to some of the directions, some of the aspects you need to consider for further research and study before you um, do business with India. We're happy to answer any questions in the future. Do write in to us on the Cuban platform and have a great evening.
拜。